Hi, I'm Natalie Brunel, and thanks so much for checking out the Coin Stories podcast video page. I am talking to the legends in Bitcoin about their backstories, career paths, and why they believe in BTC. This podcast does not provide financial advice. This episode is brought to you by the Bitcoin Conference 2022. It's going to be held in Miami next year, April 6th through 9th, and it is going to be a four-day amazing festival with two general admission days, an industry day, and SoundFest. Tens of thousands of people will make their way to Miami, and I wanted to share some photos from the 2021 conference because that event is one of the reasons Coin Stories took off, and I was able to secure such amazing interviews with legends like Michael Saylor. Now you wanna get your ticket pretty soon because hotels are booking up fast. I know I recently just booked. So head to b.tc slash conference to get your pass and use coin stories as the code for 10% off. This episode is also brought to you by OKCoin, one of my favorite new places to buy Bitcoin. OKCoin is the fastest growing exchange serving over 190 countries globally with the easiest onboarding and lowest fees around. They're on a mission to make learning about and buying Bitcoin easier than ever. And they're all about bringing more financial financial literacy to everyone, which is something I really care about as well. From being the only exchange to integrate Lightning to contributing over a million dollars to Bitcoin core devs, they are doing incredible work to further the Bitcoin ecosystem. You can head to go.okcoin.com slash Natalie for $50 in Bitcoin when you sign up. I'm super excited to share my guest today is Bitcoin security and privacy expert Jameson Lopp. Jameson is a professional cypherpunk, a business advisor, and the co-founder and CTO of Kaza. His mission is to use his skills as a technologist to build tools that empower individuals. And one way he's striving for that is by making it easier for people to take custody of their Bitcoin and manage their private keys. If you follow Jameson, you know that he went on a several year journey to reorganize his online identity and achieve ultra privacy after a very scary swatting incident, which we'll get into. Here's Jameson. All right, Jameson, super excited to have you on Coin Stories. Thanks so much for joining me today. My pleasure. All right, let's start at the very beginning. I know that we have to keep some aspects of your identity private, so I'm gonna try to ask you questions that are maybe a little bit more general, but I wanna hear just about your background, your early life. Where are you from? Is it North Carolina? That's right, uh, native North Carolinian. And I think my ancestry in North Carolina um, was actually traced back to the late 1700s by my grandfather. Wow. Well, so what do you know? What do you know about them? What do you know about your ancestors? Uh, well, that they came over from the Lapland region, which I think is near Germany, Austria. Uh, and like our original last name was Lap, but at some point it got Americanized into Lop. And uh, <clears throat> I think we came in, you know, through New York, um, very New England area. A, a number of Lops ended up settling in Pennsylvania, but fairly early, my branch uh, of the family tree came down to North Carolina and had been in there, that area since I think the early 1800s. So other than that, uh, I think they fed there, they were living fairly normal lives. Um, you know, most of my detailed understanding of our history only really begins with my great grandfather, and then uh, my grandfather was a, a fairly regular old Joe who uh, ended up uh, fighting in the Second War. And he uh, was in a B-14 Flying Fortress, I believe. Uh, wow. Basically ran like 40 or 50 missions over Germany right at the very end of the war. Um, wow. I, I, I actually, uh, he, he died, you know, five or six years ago and we found his personal journal that he never told anybody that he had. And uh, we learned a lot about his, his missions and you know, how many of his friends he lost basically saw going down in flames all around him. And uh, yeah, he was a you know, pretty tough guy and uh, taught oh me a lot. That's amazing. Wait, and so for people who are wondering, Jameson Lop is your real name right? That's correct. Okay, wait, so tell me a little bit more about just your upbringing. What did your parents do? Did you grow up kind of interested in technology, <laughs> privacy? Uh, well, I was definitely uh, nerdy. Uh, only child. My parents were very um, focused on my education and 
I you know, always did well in school, had plenty of good opportunities uh, from an academic standpoint, never really did much in terms of athletics. I was more of a band geek. And um, it was kind of weird, though, because despite all of my parents' focus on academics, they really hated technology. And so I didn't get a computer until I think sixth or no seventh grade. And I think that was mostly a pity purchase because we had moved all the way across the state and I lost all my friends. And I think my parents uh, oh. felt bad for me. So they finally caved uh, to getting me a computer. And that was you know, mid 1990s. So it was basically still dial up only at the time, very early days of the internet. And I just spent a ton of time on there so much so that um, my parents were always telling me to go outside and play or go meet up with people. They didn't understand that I was having interactions with other people all the time, just through the computer. They saw it more as like a video game uh, type of thing. And of course I was playing plenty of games too. But it got to the point where they would you know, literally take like the power cords away so I couldn't turn it on. And so then I would go uh, to, to various thrift stores and just buy tons of power cables that I would keep yeah. as backups. Uh, learning the, the lessons of having uh, redundancies and preventing single points of failure at an early <laughs> Did you, what did you think about money back then? Do you rem remember? Money was never really a concept that I delved into until I read the Bitcoin white paper in 2012. So before that, I think I just used money like anybody else. I didn't really know much about how it worked at a fundamental level. And the, the Bitcoin white paper was interesting because you know I ended up getting a computer science degree and was working as a software engineer. And when I read the white paper, I realized that this was solving an interesting problem that I had never even thought about. But the way that it solved it was interesting because it kind of flipped it on its head um, as opposed to like a naive way you might go trying to implement some sort of online monetary system. So you know, that got me interested from a technical standpoint. It got me interested also from a philosophical standpoint. And that was what triggered my interest in learning more about finance and economics and how you know, money actually works. Well, I'm just curious, before we talk a little bit about how you got into to Bitcoin and even discovering the white paper, when you were growing up, what did you want to be when you grew up? And did your family feel comfortable with money? Did you guys have money? Yeah, so I would say uh, I grew up fairly privileged, uh, standard middle class household. You know, we were well off enough that my mother could stay at home and, and take care of the household, and my father had, uh, I guess, a, a pretty well paying white collar job doing marketing for insurance companies. Um, you know, nothing that was ever that interesting to me, but kept him busy, and. Um, we never really talked much about money. Uh, in fact, I would say my, my parents were very private about it. Uh, they, they never talked to me about you know, budgeting or, or income or, or really anything like that. I would say that um, I didn't even start really looking into personal finance stuff until I graduated from college and I was finally you know, cut free on my own, had to worry about things like budgeting and long-term planning uh, for my own finances. It's interesting. I always ask that question because my upbringing was so different. I always heard about money because we immigrated here. We didn't have money. So <laughs> it was like a constant conversation. But um, so you went to school to study computer science. Why? What did you want to be? Why, why computer science? Yeah, so I'm sure when I was really young, I wanted to be cool things like an astronaut or a firefighter or whatever. Um, but when I graduated from high school and I looked at all of the possible majors at the university, I didn't know what I wanted to be. Uh, I got out the list of all several hundred majors, I guess, started going through it alphabetically and crossing things off that just sounded terribly boring. And by the time I got through it, the only thing I had not crossed off was computer science. So uh, it was a fairly straightforward decision for me. Like I knew that I loved pretty much everything about computers. I didn't know what I was going to do with them over the long run. But even by the time that I graduated high school, I had already been uh, building websites, you know, writing 
some code by hand and had uh, taken a uh, programming class at my local university uh, during summer school. Uh, that's how nerdy I was. I went to college when I was still in high school during the summer instead of. You know, oh, wow. Around. Wow. Okay. Well, so what was your early career like? Did you, were you working while you were in college or what were your first jobs afterwards? Yeah. Um, so it was kind of part of, I guess, my interest in being independent was that um, once I moved off to college, I never went back, uh, not even during summer. Um, and of course, I had to sustain myself in order to do that. So I, I got m multiple jobs when I was a student. Um, I was fortunate enough that my parents were paying for my tuition but uh, they wanted me to come home. So they were not interested in paying for me to have room and board during the summer. So in order to cover that, I became a resident advisor uh, during the summers. And then during the school year, so that I would just have money to pay for extra stuff, uh, I probably spent most of it on computer hardware, to be honest. I had like an incre a crazy, uh, level of uh, storage uh, for the time um, because I was a huge, uh, yeah, I guess I can admit it now. I'm sure it's beyond the statute of limitations, limitations, but I was, you know, I was pirating stuff like crazy because I had no money, uh, but I loved, you know, games and yeah. movies and TV shows and stuff. And so um, I probably had one of the biggest like peer to peer uh, file sharing services on any uh, university campus uh, back in the day. It was actually in the early days of internet two and there were some new file sharing apps that came out that only allowed internet to um, college university IP addresses to get on them and you could share files at like 10 megabytes a second at the time, which was you know insanely fast compared to speeds that most people had. But yeah, so I was, you know, I was doing other things um, actually, pretty much all of those jobs were through university. So um, one of the first computer science classes I took was a computer ethics class. It was also one of my favorite and most interesting. And immediately after the semester after taking that, I reached out to the professor and I said, you know, I want to work for you. So for the rest of my time at university, I was also a teaching assistant for uh, this computer ethics class. Um, also, by my sophomore year, I was doing tech support at the uh, UNC hospital. So I, I also, for the rest of my time uh, at university, was doing sort of part-time in between classes, just like taking a bus down to the other end of campus where the medical uh, campus was and um, going through the hospital, basically fixing all the doctors' computers who were, interestingly enough, mostly tech illiterate despite you know how well educated and, and intelligent that they were yeah um and then uh, i also at some point started doing some uh, programming jobs for um information library science uh, on campus so i think at one point i actually had three possibly four jobs simultaneously uh, all through the university, which was fun because then I, I must have hit some sort of edge case with the payroll program and they were drastically underpaying me for a little, little while and then they drastically overpaid me for a little while <laughs> and I got into this whole situation where it it got to where I was within, I was in my last semester at university and I started getting all these threatening letters from the finance department at the university that I owed them several thousand dollars because of their accounting mistakes and overpaying me over the past year or so. And they threatened not to give me my diploma until I repaid what? all of that. And I was like, look, you know, you you screwed this up for over a year. So, you know, you have to give me some time to, to fix up your mistake. So that was fun. Whoa. Okay, wait. So what was your first job out of college? And at what point did you read the white paper? What were you doing then? Yeah, so my first job was at a, a small startup. It was called Bronto, sort of like the Brontosaurus. And uh, it was a email marketing web application, software as a service type of uh, setup. Started there, there were only about 15 employees and I actually managed to stay there for almost 10 years. Um, However, I was changing jobs within the organization every 18 to 24 months. And that seems to be a fairly standard thing. I think with uh, computer science folks, 
fresh out of school, they tend to change jobs every two or three years, usually because you get bored of whatever you're working on or because you realized you've, you've kind of upped your, your game, your skills, and you're more marketable. And it's really, really hard to get massive pay raises while staying at the same company. So I managed to do that, but um, it wasn't easy. It was definitely adversarial um, on three or four different occasions over the years. I went out to the market because I realized how underpaid I was and I got competing job offers and brought them back to my employer. And thankfully the employer always decided that they would prefer to keep me on and they would match those job offers. That's smart. Uh, Until, yeah, until it got to the point where after about 10 years and I had been a Bitcoin enthusiast for a number of years, just doing some side projects in my free time that I decided that I might as well work on it full time uh, because it was the only thing that I could really even focus on. It was, I'm sure it was negatively affecting my, my work uh, as it was already at the time. And there was really no amount of money that they could uh, offer me to, to stay on doing marketing related, like statistical analysis stuff. Well, okay. So tell me about that Bitcoin journey. Um, obviously, it seems like you were predisposed to it just with your computer background. But what really sent you down the rabbit hole? You know, tell me about that, you know, picking up the white paper for the first time and just, you know, did you did you buy a bunch? What happened? Right. So, you know, there's the there's the theory of Bitcoin, which I thankfully already had enough skills, I think, to grasp why I felt like the system had the potential to work from a technical standpoint. But then there's the reality of Bitcoin. So it wasn't until some months after reading the white paper and actually acquiring some Bitcoin and using it and realizing that you you could exchange it for other things of value, that's when it became real to me. And it was actually a real pain at the time. Um, I had to go to my bank and fill out several pages of paperwork to send an international wire transfer to some random bank in Japan in order to to get myself some Bitcoin because there were not many exchanges at the time. Right. And this, of course, was uh, Mt. Gox, Gox, um, (laughs) which everyone is familiar with. And it was a scary experience. First of all, I had never sent any wire transfer before. Uh, Second of all, the bank were very um, upfront about telling me that you know this was a very high risk thing that once the money was sent they couldn't get it back for me and so i had to be like look i I understand you know this is basically like a new experiment and i need to get some of this so i can play around with it and i i'm willing to you know completely lose all the money that i'm sending over there so uh, yeah, got got some of the Bitcoin, started okay. playing around with it. How much was it then, and how much were you willing to send in that in that manner? It it wasn't a lot, uh, you know. It was uh, it was you know less than like a week's salary, basically. Okay. You know, I wasn't risking. I, I wasn't treating it like an investment, right? Um, and Bitcoin cost how much? A couple hundred. Uh, well, at the time it was still in the high single digits. Wow. Uh, so, you know, it was around $10 or so oh. at the time. Um, and thankfully, you know, that's when there was, it was probably not the first bubble. The first bubble was really went from, I think like $2 to $30 and that had already happened and it had crashed down. Uh, and I think the first bubble that I really got to experience was up to like a hundred dollars or so before it crashed back down. Uh, so you know that was the wild ride, but I wasn't treating it like an investment. I, at least not a short-term investment. I I figured that this was really just a hedge against long-term inflation. So it it wasn't until after. I basically went all in with my career that I also decided to go all in with my finances. And that was actually the first article that I ever wrote about Bitcoin in, it was in 2015. It was at, at right after uh, the Mt. Gox crash and uh, liquidation uh, you know, where tons of people lost their money. Um, but that was when I figured that 
I wanted to turn my retirement into Bitcoin. And so the first article that I ever wrote about Bitcoin on my blog was how to sell, set up a self-directed IRA. Because I found that if you set up a self-directed IRA, you could actually invest it in pretty much anything. There's only a few rules around things that you can't invest in, uh, usually things that are like tied to you personally. So that was um, that was that that required a ton of conviction because I started buying, um, you know, in a, a high volume from a personal standpoint of you know converting most of my net worth. And I started buying when I think the exchange rate was around seven or eight hundred dollars, you know, because it had gone up to a thousand or twelve hundred before it started correcting, and then it went all the way down to I think around $300 and I was buying the entire way down. And, and at some, at one point I lost half of my retirement uh, value. Uh, so I think my, my dollar cost average ended up in the like high $400 range. Uh, but, wow. but then it was like a multi-year bear market. And so there was, there was certainly a while where people were like, Oh, you lost all your retirement money. And I was like, Maybe, but uh, thankfully I, I held out for the long term. Okay, wait, two questions. Number one, did you lose anything at Mount Gox? And number two, what changed your mind that you decided to go full in? Like what was it? Because back then compared to today, arguably inflation wasn't as bad of a crisis or threat. Um, so what was it where you just had this total shift and you're ready to go all in on something that most people would say is extraordinarily risky? Yeah. Uh, so thankfully, I understood not your keys, not your coins before I think Andreas even uh, coined that phrase. Uh, so all that I ever did with Mt. Gox is I wired them dollars, immediately bought the Bitcoin and immediately withdrew it to self-custody. And, and self-custody at the time, that was also, um, I would say, more complicated than what you can do today. Like there were no hardware devices, there was no Trezor, there was only really software wallets. So I was I was basically running this uh, you know, Bitcoin Core software, you know, the full node. It's a very heavyweight application to run on uh, a laptop, and you know I was basically keeping those keys on the laptop. Um, I I, did, I don't think at the time I even really knew about air gapped computer stuff. So uh, that's basically what I was keeping my life savings on for several years before I really started going more down the security rabbit hole. And especially once Trezors came out, uh, obviously switched over to that. But um, what made me so convicted? I think that I just started realizing that the system was so widely distributed from so many different aspects of how it was operating that I became more and more convinced that it was like the internet itself, that it could not be shut down, regardless of what you know any individual actor might do to screw up. So while this was actually my, my very first interview about Bitcoin was in, I think, February of 2014, and there was a local uh, bakery in Durham, North Carolina, started accepting Bitcoin. I think they may have been one of the first like brick and mortar shops in North Carolina to accept Bitcoin. And I learned about it somehow um, that they were going to start accepting it on a certain day. And I went and I showed up. You know, I was like first or second person in line. There was only a couple other nerds there who were doing the same thing. And the local news station showed up, <laughs> and they they interviewed me about it. And you know, they were asking. The only thing they were interested in was like, well, isn't this Bitcoin thing dying? Like because Mt. Gox uh, crashed, everybody lost all their money. And I was explaining to them that you know Mt. Gox is basically just one user on the network, and this is a system that has no bailouts. So they made a mistake. People will have to pay for it, but eventually the system will recover. Um, and over the long run, I was proven right. But definitely that was one of those moments where everybody was saying that Bitcoin was dead. And my conviction was telling me basically the opposite because this was not the first time. And I've, I've had a number of other experiences throughout my life where I've, I've had people telling me that whatever I believed in was completely a fad that was over and done. And the, the first one that really um, happened to me 
was actually when I was going to college. Um, like I told you, I decided on computer science. Well, this was very early 2000s. And a lot of people that I told that I was doing computer science major said, oh, that's a shame because you know the internet was a fad and the bubble popped and it's all over. And I was like, you know, I think this internet thing is going to be around for a while, so I'm not too worried about it. And so while at the time it was actually kind of tough to get a job in the software engineering space, by the time I graduated from college, we were back in uh, very bullish times. Um, and then it was actually just a year or so after that, there was the great uh, you know, crash of 2008 that uh, thankfully I had only just started investing and doing retirement planning at the time. And even though my portfolio got cut in half, it was only like a year worth of investment and I got to ride the, the bull market after that. That's amazing. You know, I love watching the early videos of when the internet came out, even, you know, news programs that talked about what is this at symbol and what is what is the internet? And I remember watching like Katie Couric talking about it on the Today Show and she's like, I don't think I'm going to use it. You know, I don't I think it's just going to be something that some people decide to use and not others. And just in not a long amount of time, I mean, it's transformed all of our lives. So I kind of equate it to to Bitcoin, and I'm sure you've heard, you know, the comparisons of just the adoption rate, right? We're adopting faster than the internet. Is that right? Well, yeah, I think th this is what's happening generally over time is that the adoption curves for technology are becoming steeper. That is, people are adopting new technologies faster and faster. So, you know, just as other things like um, technology in general is accelerating, supply chains have continued to become more and more efficient and faster. Though, of course, at the expense of robustness, that's a whole other uh, set of issues we can talk about. But, um, you know, the world is becoming a smaller place. And um, I still am just constantly amazed by the, the acceleration of technology. And it's not, when we say technology, it doesn't have to be the internet and computer stuff. I just made a remark last night where I just got a, a high-end flashlight. It was a few hundred dollars. But... What I hadn't realized is the state of flashlight technology yeah. and um, the electronics, not just the the bulbs. Of course, the bulbs are one part, but the entire you know hardware stack that constitutes a handheld flashlight has actually improved in terms of performance and uh, uh, durability over the past decade. It's gotten at least an order of magnitude better. And so I got this flashlight that I've been testing out and you can literally illuminate an entire football field with a handheld wow. flashlight now for a few hundred dollars. And this is just one example. I mean, other people also commented on, well, even hair dryers are like 10 times better than they were 10 years ago. You know, I bought a hair dryer recently that uh, it's like instantly as hot as you want. Uh, it, it blows as hard as you you want but it's not insanely loud like they've managed to do that while also reducing the decibel level and improving the acoustics so um it's it's i think great to be a technologist because it's really easy to be an optimist uh mm -hmm. if you just extrapolate going back a decade or two decades yeah no that's so true well so what was your first kind of job in bitcoin like you leave your job you you're working in bitcoin full-time how did you get from sort of that I, I guess that point of the journey to all of a sudden now people know who you are and you have this squatting incident that has taken up so much of the last several years of your life. Yeah. So I started looking around, you know, I was in North Carolina. Um, I was, well, I was going to Bitcoin meetups. I ended up uh, founding a more like technical Bitcoin meetup, but I think that was after I started full time. So probably 2015 or so. Um, so it was early 2015. I saw a bunch of venture capital coming into the space. I saw a lot of job openings, but nothing in North Carolina. It was all happening in Silicon Valley. So I started looking around and I forget why, but I was not interested in moving to Silicon Valley. I think it was probably mostly politics and the fact that I, I was aware of the high taxes and the fact that several of the firearms that I owned were illegal in California. So <laughs> I wanted to continue staying in North Carolina, but work for Bitcoin, 
which uh, that cut down my opportunities quite a bit. There were only a couple of, of companies that were hiring engineering jobs that would were even open to the possibility of having a remote worker. So I uh, ended up accepting a position at BitGo. I was their first remote worker, and we ended up bringing on quite a few remote workers uh, in the years after that. But at the time, it, it actually reminded me of my first company at Bronto, because once again, there were only about a dozen or so people working there, but ended up being a very high growth startup. So uh, you know, Bronto in the 10 years I was there went from 15 to 300 employees and then ended up having an acquisition a few years after I left. BitGo, I worked there for three years and we went from a dozen to probably 60 or 70 employees. And then I think today, like three years later, they have several hundred employees. Uh, so it, it's been interesting to ride these startup waves. Um, one thing that I've learned though, is that I do a lot better in startups that have under 50 employees because you start creating all these hierarchies and bureaucracies uh, that slow things down. And I like the freedom. I like to be able to move quickly and not have to you know, ask permission from too many people. So how did this squatting event happen? Someone was, you know, targeting you and obviously we'll get to the discovery of who it was and maybe the surprise when it when it came to that that person's identity. But how did that happen? Yeah, well, as soon as I learned about Bitcoin, I started occasionally just tweeting my thoughts on it. And uh, at the time in 2012, 2013, uh, before that bubble up to a thousand dollars or so, nobody was really paying attention to me. I had maybe a couple hundred followers. And from my perspective, I just kept doing the same thing. And whenever something interesting came up that was Bitcoin related, I would tweet it out. And I guess it, I kind of see it as, um, it's kind of like the the quote that you hear from a lot of uh, people regarding startups and IPOs and stuff that they were, uh, you know, an overnight success of 10 years of hard work. Mm -hmm. And so I think it was just sort of me consistently uh, you know, writing tweets and blog posts and, and other pieces, uh, you know, sometimes publishing software as well, that uh, over about a 10 year period, uh, eventually that just created larger and larger audience. So by the time the 2017 bull market cycle was really ramping up, I think by then I had over 100,000 followers. Um, it would be interesting to see, I think, how my following chart went over time, but I'm pretty sure it was, you know, hockey stick uh, that, that basically got triggered during the various uh, bull markets. Wow. And uh, this happened to coincide with the great scaling debate. It had been building up for several years in Bitcoin, and there had been a lot of heated discussions. Um, and it, at some point, there were some people who saw me arguing on Twitter and decided that uh, I would be a good target to, to prank and to try to extort. And so that's when someone essentially... They swatted me, which means that they made a phone call to my local law enforcement and they said the right keywords to trigger a tactical response team. So uh, swatting is this phenomenon that has been happening since the late 2000s. It originated in the video gaming and streaming community where uh, you know someone would be playing video games and having a camera on them. And uh, if they pissed somebody off or perhaps a rival of some sort, the, the goal would be to try to capture them on their own camera on their live stream with a SWAT team coming through the door and you know, yeah. screwing everything. So, um, this has morphed over the years as Bitcoin has changed some of the incentives and, and essentially swatting can now be used as a like harassment and extortion technique, because what you're really doing is you're directing you know, physical force and potentially deadly uh, violent uh, people at an arbitrary target if you just say the right words. So uh, basically you, you have to you know, find that person's address and then claim that there's some sort of incident going on at that address that is a like life or death violent situation. So- And what did they say about you? It was like hostage? 
Yeah. So in my case, they, they said that they were me and that I had killed someone and had a hostage and had a bomb in the house. And, you know, they basically said like all the things that, you know, are going to get a SWAT team uh, triggered. And, and so this resulted in my whole neighborhood being shut down and, um, you know, it was, it was a somewhat traumatic experience. You realize how vulnerable you really are. Um, and it, it, it kicked off about a year of me using my own resources to better understand what high privacy options are, you know, how to really hide where you are and what you're doing from with, uh, while following the law, you know, using completely legal um, techniques. And once I had moved away from my address and basically cut ties with everything that was, uh, it was creating a link between me and my location. That's when I, I went on the offensive and I started uh, trying to track down the person who did that to me. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about that journey because I know you spent a lot of money. And I read this really interesting New York Times article about just all the ways in which you decided to change your identity or, you know, not change your identity, but make it difficult for someone to track you down and really hone in on privacy. And it's just so many aspects that you'd never even think about. Like you, you have to find a state first of all, that allows you to not use a name when you file for an LLC. Right. And then there's like a DMV situation for you to buy a car. Can you just like walk us through all the things that you did, maybe how much it cost you and, and why you decided to go to such lengths? Yeah. So when it comes to privacy, one reason it can be overwhelming is that there's just so many different aspects of your life that you can try to make private. And there are plenty of things that someone can do just by spending a weekend, you know, improving your online privacy, you know, installing ad blockers, setting up VPNs to you know, protect your real IP address from being leaked, uh, setting up more private email addresses, you know, setting up um, password managers uh, so that you're, you're not reusing uh, information across different websites. Um, after that, you, know, you can look into financial privacy. There are various options where you can essentially set up uh, throwaway uh, virtual credit cards so you're not reusing, once again, the same information everywhere. Um, but the extreme level of privacy, if you're trying to protect yourself and your physical location so that you can't be targeted and swatted and have you know physical violence be threatened against you that's the really hard thing and a lot of that is really a result i think of uh corporate surveillance uh it's there's also some you know, government aspects in there the um the tricky thing from a corporate surveillance standpoint is you have to realize that like, every time you have any sort of economic interaction with someone these days, you're providing an address, even if you're not having something physically shipped to you. So uh, setting up private mailboxes that are not your residence and using them for receiving everything um, or even as your billing address on credit cards, just so that you don't have your home address as credit card. Uh, that's a fairly simple, straightforward way to protect most of that stuff. But then the really hard part is the government related identity stuff, uh, especially things around uh, taxes, around uh, DMV, around any publicly registered assets. Uh, so, you know, usually that means house and car, maybe boat. Uh, you know, things that are registered in your name that you pay property tax on, those tend to be the things that create links between you and your residents. And in order to sever those links, you have to use other legal structures such as trusts and LLCs to own that property in the first place and, and essentially have the names of those trusts and LLCs on the publicly uh, registered um, forms and documents so that your name isn't even on them. But you know this creates a lot more complexity. You're basically creating this whole legal framework that is acting kind of as a firewall between you and the rest of the world uh, that can see these publicly registered um, assets. 
But I mean, you do, you know, interviews, right? So people in your community must know who you are and can't someone just see like where you drive home? I mean, how, how much of a secret have you been able to keep with your identity? Right. So uh, no one in my physical neighborhood knows my real identity. They know my pseudonym that I give to them. And wow. obviously I have a backstory and I'll, I'll tell them I work in cybersecurity, but I know enough about cybersecurity that I can talk about other aspects of cybersecurity unrelated to crypto. Um, and, uh, you know, even if someone was looking like if someone who did recognize me saw me out in public and even then if they saw me getting into my car and even then if they looked at the license plate and somehow were able to look up information for that that would not tie me back to my actual address because you know the car is owned by an llc and the llc is registered with a registered agent at a completely different address so wow. it, that's like it's like what i said at the very beginning there's so many different aspects of it um now it could very well be that we get to the point where uh, facial recognition is so ubiquitous that any average person can basically use facial recognition software to try to look you up we're not at that point yet uh, but th this is a dynamic environment and i'll just have to adjust uh, as needed going forward what was the most surprising part of this journey to make yourself so so private that maybe people would benefit from learning so the, the there's pros and cons um pro is that i'm in the united states and the united states affords you to use some things like some jurisdictional arbitrage where some states have better privacy than others and you can you know, set up these um trusts and llc's in other states and and then use them wherever you need them um it's still a, one of the cons, of course, is it's expensive. Um, you're basically, you're retaining attorneys and accountants and then other specialists, you know, registered agents and whatnot to set up and then maintain these legal structures. Um, but it is better than a lot of other countries. Uh, so my understanding is it's very difficult, if not nearly impossible to set up stuff similar to this in a lot of European countries, for example, because, um, even if you create the same legal structures, you're basically still forced to expose a lot of the internal uh, ownership of the legal structures uh, to the public. So you basically, you're losing the privacy aspects of them. Um, also things like with phones uh, in, in the US, it's, it's, it's more difficult than it used to be, but it's still possible to get a, a phone or specifically a SIM card anonymously without providing your identification. Whereas in a lot of other countries, it's kind of like the, the DMV requirements where they're not going to give you anything unless you basically do AML KYC. Uh, DMV stuff in the U.S. is one of the most onerous. They, you know, depends on the state, but generally it will ask for two, if not three or four really strong proofs of not only your identity, but of your uh, living at the address where you're giving uh for your like vehicle registration and driver license and whatnot. And the only way I've really found around that is to like actually have a real residence and address somewhere that you just simply don't hang out at that often. Wow. Okay. I have more specific questions about this, but I want to zoom out for a second and just ask why, why do you feel privacy is so important? I mean, in this increasingly digital world where companies and corporations are collecting our data and there's, you know, surveillance technology. Why should we care about privacy in your opinion? Well, I could spend an hour talking about all of the things that could go wrong. And obviously I have this extreme example of having a SWAT team come to my house. Um, I think that is the extreme example is that, you know, you might have some sort of physical uh, violence directed at you. This is generally not something that people need to be worried about unless they are, a really public figure with a large audience or they are doing something that is basically creating enemies that would go to that extreme of, of wanting to perpetrate violence against you. Um, but I think the bigger thing is that you, you just don't know what might happen in the future. And while this type of like swatting, stalking, harassment stuff, uh, 
pre-internet age was generally relegated to your like superstar celebrities who had hundreds of millions of fans and therefore just due to the law of large numbers there's gonna be a few nut jobs in there you're gonna have somebody who's gonna do something that is uh, potentially dangerous uh, for whatever reason and what I think the internet has done is like, it's really lowered the bar. It's made it so much easier for people to perpetrate crimes and, um, and you know, potentially violence against you that um, you, you might think that nobody is ever gonna care or do anything like that against you. But because of the internet, you can go overnight from being a nobody to being uh, someone who has the attention and potentially the ire of tens or hundreds of millions of people. And uh, you know, good examples of that. Uh, one that I often give is Justine Sacco, who was a marketing uh, manager at some uh, marketing firm in New York. And she had family, I think in South Africa or something. And she was flying there for the holidays. And before she got on the plane, she tweeted some sort of racially insensitive thing about like hoping she didn't get AIDS when she went to South Africa. And, uh, and that blew up, it became viral. She had like 200 followers on Twitter, but that tweet went so viral that I think hundreds of millions of people saw it. And so some of them were sufficiently enraged that they started harassing her family, her employer. Some of them even showed up at the airport mm -hmm. to, to see her get off the plane when she landed. Uh, she, I think she ended up getting fired and you know, having a lot of other consequences just due to one really bad joke that she made. So like you never know when something crazy like that could happen because it's so much easier for it to happen today. And you know, this is also kind of what happened to me though over a longer period of time, over a matter of years, I went from being a nobody to having hundreds of thousands of people pay attention to me. And eventually, you know, one of them uh, who had the skills and the poor enough judgment decided that they wanted to um, you know, perpetrate this against me. Yeah, and how hard was it to figure out who that person was and what's the result of that investigation? Because you recently got an update, right? Oh yeah, it was difficult because you know they, unlike me, they were already operating from a highly uh, privacy conscious setup. Um, I think this was because they had been doing a number of illegal things, and so they knew that they needed that level of protection. So it, I mean, it took four years to get to a conclusion in the case. There are many points at which it could have fallen apart. Uh, the whole investigation could have stopped, but it, it cost me, you know, over, I think $10,000 um, just in terms of legal fees, um, you know, paying for attorneys, private investigators, whatnot. Uh, one of the big, triggers i think that helped even get the investigation started was putting a very large hundred thousand dollar bounty out on this person and so that's what helped get some of those those tips to come in uh, but then i also i had to have some luck on top of everything else it was really hard to find um lawyers who would work with someone who is interested in prosecuting rather than, than defending so I think the vast majority of private legal practices are for defense rather than offense. Usually it's the state that does the prosecuting, but I did not have a lot of uh, success whenever I tried to reach out to law enforcement and state uh, officials. And you know, after about a year of trying to, to contact someone with the FBI, the, I, I finally got in contact with someone only because I made a sort of happenstance uh, connection at a, uh, a Bitcoin related event. So it's hard. It's really hard to get justice, um, especially if it's not what would be considered a like high priority, um, high threat to, to life type of crime. Well, so who, who was it? It was some punk teenager, uh, who oddly enough, I am, um, 
not a liberty to discuss their details because they're a juvenile. And so we right. ended up going through the juvenile uh, justice system. And, uh, you know, you, you're, you're basically supposed to protect these juveniles uh, until they're adults. And once they're adults, if they screw up, uh, you know, then everything becomes publicized. Well, so what was your reaction to finding out this person's age? And if you could have a conversation with this person, what would you say? Yeah, um, it wasn't completely surprising. Um, it made sense because, you know, teenagers, um, they tend to understand technology even better than the older folks who might be in their 30s and, and beyond. And um, also, you know, it's more likely that you don't understand the consequences of doing stuff like that. So I think it, it was it was a perfect storm of, of you know, skills and ability and lack of, of understanding consequences that resulted in that. And I did actually get to meet and talk to this person. And um, I basically flew to one of the hearings at the juvenile court and, and basically spoke my piece, gave my perspective on the whole situation. And yeah, you know, I, I tend to believe their story that, you know, they at the time did not realize the seriousness of it. And they were kind of thinking it was like a prank phone call. Wow. Um, okay. So obviously you had the means to go into this, this journey to privacy that a lot of people probably would not, would not take the way that you did. What's one thing that the average person can do? What's one very important thing that someone can do to protect themselves as we're, you know, transacting online, especially for people who have Bitcoin? Yeah, most important thing I think is just taking a few minutes to install a bunch of ad blockers uh, on your your browsers. Uh, that that'll that'll save you from a lot of the corporate surveillance uh, that happens. Uh, like I said, I worked for an online marketing company for 10 years. My job was actually to ingest all of this raw tracking data that gets picked up from pixels in your emails, uh, you know, tracking cookies and, and other code uh, that's on every website that you load. And then basically pull that all together and write tools for marketers to then be able to better sell stuff to you uh, based on your profile that we, we build up. So I certainly understood er very early on you know, how poor privacy experience was for the average person uh, just browsing the internet. Uh, next step you can do after that, like I said, was get a VPN because that's how you hide your IP address, which also hire, hides your rough geolocation. Uh, from then on, for less than $50 a month, you can get a P.O. box or some sort of private mailbox so that you can disassociate your shipping and billing address with your actual residence. And I would say if you're willing to spend a couple hundred dollars a month, you can get, you know, 90, 95% of the way there. It's that last five to 10%, especially with the, the government related stuff, the, the legal uh, related stuff, that the, uh, the cost and the amount of time and resources uh, just goes exponential. So I'm assuming we should always say no to the, you know, accept cookies prompt that comes up on all these websites, right? What are the ad blockers that you recommend? What are the companies? Uh, I have multiple installed. I, I recommend installing uBlock Origin. Uh, that's a, a free one. You can load a bunch of lists into. I would also install all of the stuff uh, from the Electronic Frontier Foundation. I think they have one called Privacy Badger. They also have um, an extension that's called, I think, um, uh, something like SSL always or HTTPS always, which will basically force as many of your uh, website connections as possible to go over SSL. So everything's encrypted, uh, just providing it with more privacy there. Um, that's that's going to cover the vast majority of it, but you know, even this will create inconvenience from time to time you will find yourself trying to use a website and it won't work. And that's because your privacy uh, ad blocker stuff will be uh, preventing some code from running that it turns out is like uh, critical for like some of the functionality on that website. So there, there's always some sort of trade-off between convenience and privacy and security. 
Yeah, no, that's so true. Well, before I start to wrap up, because I want to hear a little bit about CASA and, and your current updates, but just all of this makes me very curious about Satoshi and just how much Satoshi, whoever that person or group is, knew about security and privacy. So, I mean, basically there's no way to track where those initial sort of notes and emails and blog posts came from. I mean, how is it so hard to track down Satoshi? They were just that good at OPSEC? Yeah, uh, from what we can tell, Satoshi certainly seemed to be a cypherpunk. Um, from the, the potential trails or breadcrumbs that they could have left, they were pretty much always using some sort of privacy preserving service. So for example, um, I think Satoshi was using uh, GMX and possibly Vesto Mail. Uh, they were using some um, you know, email services that were known to be better privacy preserving. Um, I think there may have been a few places where people thought that they got some IP addresses, but it looked like Satoshi was, was probably using VPN. Um, you know, Satoshi also registered the Bitcoin.org domain, uh, and I think they used a privacy preserving service for that, where they, they likely mailed an envelope of cash to that service, basically to pay for it, because, you know, this was, this was before there were any real, uh, like private cryptocurrencies or any other options. So from, uh, from what we can tell, I mean, a lot of people have tried to track down Satoshi for years, but it seems like they did a good enough job preserving their privacy. And, and part of that, I think, was the fact that they were doing this back when nobody cared who Satoshi was because Bitcoin was some silly little experimental project. And I think that the fact that Satoshi left very early on and did not continue creating more potential breadcrumbs that, that could be used to track them, uh, that was also helpful because when you're trying to go back in time and and find information to track people down, it, it can become a lot harder because you know things tend to get deleted and lost. Yeah. Do you um, think about the identity and and why do you think that the person disappeared? Well, all we know is that they said that they moved on to other things. Um, I would be incredibly interested to know what those things were. Though, you know, there are various theories that Satoshi was someone who is now deceased. So it may be that they were dealing with their own health problems. Um, it may have just been that they saw the writing on the wall. I mean, they did make a reference, I think, to uh, one of the early Bitcoin developers going and giving a talk at the CIA. Uh, I think that freaked right. them out. Uh, they realized that it was becoming too big of a deal and they probably would not be able to continue uh, being unobserved. So do any of those early developers that were communicating with Satoshi, does anyone or does the government, do you think, know Satoshi's real identity? Do you think there's someone who knows who Satoshi is? Well, there. I mean, I think there has to be someone out there who knows, um, but no one, well, no one who has ever claimed to be Satoshi or claimed to know Satoshi has ever been able to provide sufficient proof of that. Um, if, if folks at the government know, they're certainly not talking. <laughs> all right. So um, tell me a little bit about CASA. Tell me about your position and how all that came about. Yeah, so I spent three years uh, building infrastructure at BitGo. That's where I learned a lot about private key security and also just became interested in uh, this like, non-custodial idea of being able to build Bitcoin wallets where the service may hold one key to help in certain situations, but never has enough keys to spend other people's money or stop them from being able to spend other people's money. So Kaza was really a, a, a small pivot for me to go from using this technology to help people be their own banks, mainly for enterprises, to switching to helping individuals. So this was the result of many years of hard learned lessons. A lot of people lost a lot of money uh, over the first decade or so in Bitcoin. And so we've learned a lot of things not to do. Now, the, the problem with all of this is that 
it, it's a lot of knowledge. It's, it's a high uh, barrier for newcomers to scale in order to you know, absorb all of the information that I have over the years. So in order to help people bypass that and to lower the bar, make it a better user experience, we basically have to build the software to guide people down the right path. And so that's what we've really been doing at Casa where we've been using this multi-signature technology. We've been building on top of hardware key management devices. They're produced by a number of different companies other than us uh, by design. We don't want to be uh, you know, a single point of failure uh, who is like creating too many of the internal aspects of the system. And we're basically providing an easy way for someone to get onboarded into what I consider to be a, a better than bank level self custody setup, where if you spend an hour onboarding yourself into Casa, you end up with a, a system protecting your Bitcoin that is highly distributed and has no single points of failure by a design. And all you have to do is follow the instructions you know, in the app to get set up. So by putting people into a highly defensible, ro robust position, just by following the guidance in the app, we can prevent them from being a victim of many different types of both attacks and loss due to negligence and you're shooting yourself in the foot and, and so on and so forth. So it, it's about creating robustness and redundancy and the, the crazy thing is this whole industry of, of self-custody is built around the idea that we're helping people protect a few hundred bytes of information. That's, that's all this really is. But this few hundred bytes is now the keys to the kingdom that some people have, you know, the majority of their, their life savings. And so we need to make sure that people can be comfortable and confident that they can hold that themselves. So is this essentially holding someone's hand to be their own bank and they're still very much responsible? Or is this taking some of that pressure off of them because you have this distributed network that will be sort of a backup and, and help them through through that aspect of safety and custody? Yeah, so there's, I would say, several aspects of CASA that are an important focus for us. The first one is uh, user experience. So having a really well-designed app that you run on your phone that guides you through uh, the, the setup and the maintenance of this under the hood complex multi-signature wallet that uses multiple keys on multiple devices in multiple geographic locations. Um, the next one is service where there are very few self-custody Bitcoin wallets out there that are a company that provides a high level of customer service. A lot of the wallets out there, it's you know, free software where you download it, you run it, and you figure out how to do it. You know, um, It's a sort of a caveat emptor, or you know, use it your own risk, uh, but you're responsible for figuring it out. So we, we also provide a high level of service. You know, Depending on your tier, our higher level tiers, you get dedicated client advisors that you can you know, literally schedule phone calls with and talk about whatever you want. Um, we also uh, find it important to uh, give people the peace of mind that they need. Um, uh, that's really one of the most common pieces of feedback that we get. Uh, I would say one of them is that people tend to be surprised at how easy it is to get onboarded because it is a complex system under the hood. Uh, but like I said, it only takes an hour or so to get onboarded. And then the next one is, is just the ability to get feedback and uh, feel comfortable that you have a setup that is not going to get lost or hacked or whatever. So a lot of people come to us, and they might've had their money still in the exchange where they bought it. They might've had it on a single hardware device that was in a safe and they were just super worried about what might happen to that hardware device. But once they get into a system where they know that they have sufficiently dispersed the risk such that it's unlikely that any single event was going to cause a catastrophe, then it's a lot easier for them to have peace of mind and go about their life without you know, worrying about what's going to happen to their Bitcoin. 
Yeah, I think that's such an important point and it's so critical because I think if we're going to get to mass adoption, the majority of people are not going to feel safe just putting something on essentially the a, what, what they consider a hard drive and putting it in a safe or keeping it maybe on an exchange that potentially they heard, you know, accounts got hacked or something or a SIM swap happened. So I think that this this is such an important area so that people can feel comfortable finally getting in the space. Do you agree? I mean, I think this is what we need for mass adoption. Yeah, so I did this originally. It was it was somewhat a, a self serving thing. Um, like I said, I had been at Bitgo for about three years building infrastructure, and with my own personal holdings, I found myself spending an entire weekend every year just as an annual refresher to basically update my cold storage and and redistribute uh, the data for that because uh, also I was worried about inheritance issues, you know, getting hit by a truck and nobody knowing how to actually get to those private keys. And I, I was just like, this is insane. I'm supposed to be one of the like most preeminent experts on Bitcoin security. And this is a huge hassle for me. And I do it because you know it's, it's a substantial portion of my net worth. I can only imagine what the average person who doesn't have this, they might not be as incentivized. They probably don't have the same level of skill set. Uh, and I wanted something that I also could be more confident in um, that you know, people would be able to recover uh, for inheritance and that I didn't have to spend a day or two every year updating. Uh, rather, it was just already automatically redundant. And um, that's that's sort of the individual focus. But when you, you kind of step back and you take the, the 10,000 foot view of, of what this means and why it's important that the average person has this type of, of access to being their own bank uh, in, in doing so, uh, without uh, a lot of effort, it's actually important for, I believe, the structural integrity of the entire Bitcoin ecosystem. Because if people aren't confident and comfortable in being their own bank, then they are going to end up falling back to what they consider to be the, the trusted experts. Uh, and essentially what we end up with, again, is just a lot of highly centralized custodians yeah. was kind of recreating the uh, exactly. original system that we were trying to get away from. So what are your competitors in this space? Well, from a really high level of view, you could say our competitors are any sort of Bitcoin system for custodying funds. So uh, it depends on how you break things up. You could say that self custody is competing against custody. So, you know, we're competing against a lot of the exchanges um, and uh, other like professional custody services that really just act like banks. Mm -hmm. uh, within the self custody space, you could say we're uh, competing against all of the free services that don't have a great quality of support because you're not paying for support. It's just sort of an add on that's baked into uh, perhaps if you like buy a hardware device, uh, they, you know, they probably have some additional margin that helps cover support there. Uh, otherwise you're really only getting community support and you're hoping that somebody on some forum might respond to you within the like paid self custody space. There are even fewer options. Um, one of the only ones that really comes to mind is Unchained, uh, where they also have uh, a multi-sig self-custody plus service and consulting. So it is, it's kind of like a niche within a niche, but my, my thesis on that is that you know, this type of self-custody setup is actually incredibly important. And a lot of people, either don't even know that self-custody is a thing or they don't understand why they should value it. Or if they are in a self-custody setup, they may have set it up a long time ago and have just kind of forgot about it. Or in many cases, uh, what we found are they are afraid to touch it uh, because every time you mess with your private keys, there's a potential that something might go wrong. Well, so for anyone that's wondering this in the audience, if you have a ledger or Trezor, would you also get CASA or is it a either or situation? Yeah, you can do both. Uh, so we have a 
basically $10 a month low lowest tier plan where if you already have a hardware device, you can basically bring that device, um, create your two of three Casa wallet and that hardware device you plug in and you know, we take the public keys off of that hardware device and use it to create a multi-sig. And then it's, it would be very easy for you to essentially do a withdrawal from the like only treasure or only ledger funds to the multi-sig, which is then, uh, it's still using the Trezor or Ledger, but it's only one out of three different keys uh, that are on there. And this can be, I think, kind of complicated for people to understand, like what is multi-sig, what is a, a multi-key setup. Yeah. Uh, the best way to think about it, I think, is in terms of a lockbox. So whenever you generate a Bitcoin address, What's behind that address is actually something called a redeem script, which is a set of code that describes the spending conditions for what is required in order to be able to move the funds at that address. And for most people, it's this is a single signature uh, address that says, you know, I need one signature from one private key that matches the public key that is embedded uh, inside of this redeem script. Uh, with multi-sig, we're taking that to the next level where it's it's essentially a, a piece of code that says, uh, in order to spend these funds, you have to add two signatures that match uh, any two of these three private keys, or you have to add three signatures that match any three of these five pr um, public keys. And, and so this is very similar to like having a, a lockbox in a bank where if you've ever had one, you may realize that at least the good ones, they don't have only one key. They actually have two different keys that have to be inserted and turned in order to open that up. And that's because it gives you a better trust model so that you're you're more confident that the employee with the key can't just go in and open it on their own. Uh, whereas if someone stole the key from you and went in on their own, they wouldn't be able to do that without an employee who's also you know, doing other authentication. And so this is why I say you get to be better than bank level security because you can have a, a setup that is even more distributed and, and more robust in terms of the authentication than you would have to get inside of like a high security bank vault. Yeah, I think this is such great information because I do believe that as we as we get to that maybe $1 million per coin, or I, you know, I think it's going to go even higher. This is going to be huge. This is going to be so, so, so important because I think that the people that are, are coming in late, there's going to be threats to the people who have Bitcoin and have had it for a very long time. So I think getting that information out is just so paramount. Um, I just wanted to ask you very quickly, uh, you don't have to go in the weeds, but I think there are people who wonder the inheritance issue. Like if something were to happen to me, you know, how does that all work? Is this a very, you know, emerging space where people are dealing with wills and how to actually pass on their Bitcoin? Cause I, I would imagine, you know, people just want to hold it to give to their children, right? How does that, how does that work? Right. So if this is something that you are worried about, the only really in-depth guide that I'm aware of is uh, Pamela Morgan's crypto asset planning guide, which you can order on Amazon. Uh, highly recommend it. I learned a number of things from it because it's not just about the technical aspects. It's also about uh, you know, legal and social uh, aspects to, to think about. From a technical perspective, you know, Bitcoin, the network, the protocol, it doesn't know anything about you, your identity, or your beneficiaries, or anything like that. All it knows is whether or not a you know, sufficient number of signatures have been put on a transaction to spend funds from an address. So what it boils down to is you putting the keys in some sort of storage where you can access them while you're alive, but other people can't. But if you pass on a certain you know, subset of beneficiaries that you have designated can access them. And to do this um, within multi-sig, the reason we, we like this setup is that you can create, say, a three of five multi-sig setup where you have uh, a key on your phone that is always accessible by you. You then have you know, three different hardware devices that you distribute around and then you have a key that is held offline by CASA. And so 
what we re what we set people up with for a three of hive inheritance setup is we recommend that they put one of those hardware devices in a safety deposit box that has beneficiary information listed on it. And this is safe to do, even if you consider something like a insider attack by that safety deposit box company, because it's only one out of the five keys. Um, we then recommend having a key that is accessible or, uh, by either your state attorney or an executor uh, to your will that you know they they know where it is perhaps perhaps you make a copy of that key and give them a copy of it um, or they just know how to access it and unlock it and once again this is safe because even if they try to collude against you they can only get that one key and then the CASA key that we hold is similar to the safety deposit box key in the sense that we will take down uh, beneficiary information and essentially require the same type of proof of death process that the, uh, the safety deposit box would. So at any given time, you, know, you have access to four out of the five keys and you can request, uh, of course, signatures from CASA. Um, however, if you die, uh, the CASA key, the, the friend or executor key, and then the beneficiary key in the safety deposit box can all be accessed through fairly standard uh, processes. And uh, you know that's what's great, great about distributing all of this information around is the, the level of robustness. And, and what you're really doing is you're, you're also minimizing trust. So it's hard for people to collude against you because they probably don't even know who the other people they'd have to collude with are. Um, if you're not doing multi-sig and you're worried about inheritance, then you either have to do what I did in the early days, which requires a really high level of technical sophistication, basically uh, taking these single seed phrases, uh, these private keys, and putting them in some sort of encrypted file volume, which you then uh, take the decryption passphrase to and split that up in, in multiple ways and then hand out those splits to different people uh, in order to make it you know, difficult for them to collude against you. But um, I have a whole write-up about that on a blog I made a, a few years ago, but it's not something that uh, I would recommend. Uh, it's still fairly brittle and requires technical sophistication for these beneficiaries to be able to set up and recover. Or, uh, for people who aren't that technically sophisticated, what we often see is what we call the treasure map. And someone will like generally you know, bang out their seed phrase onto a piece of metal and then maybe go hide that somewhere and then have a treasure map of like how to go find that. <laughs> and um, that can certainly work. But if it doesn't work, if, if, if at some point that treasure map gets lost or destroyed or the people just don't understand how to follow the treasure map, then uh, the money becomes irrecoverable. Wow, this is also fascinating. Thank you so much. Before I ask my last question, is there just anything else you wanted to talk about or share or you think people should know? There's more than we could ever possibly cover. <laughs> I know. Uh, but I, I mean, the, the main thing, I think, when it comes to Bitcoin and all of its complexities, it, is it, you know, I'm focused on security, uh, which is fairly straightforward, simple thing. There are so many people out there who are working on much more uh, crazy, uh, pushing the envelope type of stuff in this space. Um, and also the fact that this system is so multifaceted, you don't have to be technical to be interested in it. There are plenty of people who are interested in Bitcoin for other reasons, you know, perhaps they're economic or philosophical or whatnot. And so it's such a complex multifaceted space you can spend your time focusing on whatever is most interesting to you. And that's why if you want to figure out how to go further down the rabbit hole, you should just go to bitcoin.page, which is my educational resources site that has, uh, I can't even keep track, uh, probably like 1500 links with dozens of different subsections. So, um, you can spend as much or as little time as you want, you know, learning more about this space. Awesome. I love it. I will, I will link that in the description of this episode. And my last question is just, um, where do you see Bitcoin in 10 years? I think the next 10 will just be so pivotal. We've already moved 
you know, in the direction of mass adoption, it's growing very quickly. But I think there are also these major challenges ahead of us, right? There are these big names like Hillary Clinton coming out saying that this type of currency or technology threatens nation states. I think there are some really scary narratives out there that are going to discourage the majority of people who still have their assets in cash or cash equivalents from entering. So what do you, how do you think this is going to play out in 10 years and where do you see Bitcoin in 10 years? I'm not as worried about nation state level issues. Um, you know, we already weathered something like six years of China FUD and and crackdowns uh, to the point that, you know, they almost effectively completely banned Bitcoin. And yet, as, as I said earlier, like my conviction, my thesis uh, from very early on is that this thing cannot be stopped, you know, even if if the, some of the most powerful nation states in the world decide to crack down on it, it's going to continue to survive. Now, there's no guarantees about what its, its value or exchange rate will be, but from a purely technical perspective, the network is going to continue. So I'm, I'm especially less worried about politicians in America. I think we're already at the point, and this is one of my many Bitcoin projects, uh, if you, bitcoinpoliticians.org, I think is the website I set up for that, uh, where now I'm tracking you know, which politicians actually own Bitcoin. I think it's important from a incentive standpoint, we should want as many politicians as possible to own Bitcoin. Um, unfortunately, there's far fewer who own it than who even talk uh, optimistically about it. So I'm, I'm, I'm somewhat skeptical about the people who are always talking really nicely about it and then don't actually own any because how can they really understand it if they've never even used it? Um, but I think that the, the ownership of Bitcoin is already so dispersed and so many powerful and influential people own it that you know they're going to be applying their own um, pressure against politicians who then hopefully will also become owners who will then be incentivized to uh, not do anything stupid regarding Bitcoin. Uh, so I'm, I'm less worried about that uh, from a macro perspective, um, even though there's certainly going to be f folks who are like doing the ESG arguments and, and bas basically wailing about different things that they're unhappy about. But you know they can complain all they want. Uh, I, I don't think the Bitcoin network really cares. Um, from a macro perspective, I'm more interested in seeing, you know, what's happening with like El Salvador, for example, and that being the first domino. I, I think that this is not going to be a one-off event. It's just the first in, in a series of many, because while the individual is incentivized to opt out of fiat and into sound money, uh, which is my thesis that I entered into many years ago, this, this same thesis holds true for corporations. The same thesis holds true for many institutions, all the way up to the nation state level, especially for nation states that don't have their own monetary sovereignty and they're, they're currently uh, at the whim of other nation states and, and the, uh, the central banks and, tr and treasurers of those other nation states. So I think this is why El Salvador was the, the first mover uh, when it comes to nation state adoption because they're smart enough to realize what the first mover advantage is uh, at this scale. Yeah, and actually, I don't know if you have time to share, but you just came back from El Salvador, right? So you were there for that massive announcement, Bitcoin City, pretty much no taxes except sales tax, right? No capital gains, no property tax. Um, what do you, what, how was your trip and what's your response to that announcement? Yeah, it was interesting. Um, you know, El Salvador is still a fairly tense place. It's probably one of the, the rougher countries that I've ever visited. Still plenty of uh, security uh, threats and, and issues uh, in the country. And there's a lot of skepticism. Um, I can understand it because I would be skeptical of any government telling me, hey, you should do this because it's good for you. Um, also, just the history of El Salvador and their previous generations of governments. Uh, I think a number of them were basically highly corrupt and exit scammed and, you know, stole a bunch of money from the citizens and, and basically left, you know, without using it to actually help the citizens. And so there are plenty of people who are skeptical and afraid that the same thing may be happening now. Um, and 
basically what I, I just said last night is that this is, is a very interesting experiment. There are plenty of ways that it could fail. And we certainly as Bitcoiners want to see it succeed. So that I hope as many people as possible who have the resources and the time can find some way to contribute to helping the efforts in El Salvador. Um, it's going to be a very important test case. And there are lots of other countries who are going to be watching and they're going to make decisions based upon the outcome of what happens in El Salvador. But even if it does fail, I think we should be focused on helping the citizens of El Salvador to understand Bitcoin and its value proposition, because my hope is that they will then understand the value of self-custody so that even if the government does screw up, if something goes horribly wrong with like Chivo, with the, the government run Bitcoin banking services, that um, if, if the situation is such that a lot of El Salvadorians are self-custodying, then they won't be as exposed to those risks even if there is a, you know, a massive catastrophe at the government level, they will still be able to continue being sovereign Bitcoin users. Yeah, no, totally. So in 10 years, you would guess probably more nation states, right? What do you think the market cap will Absolutely. be? Uh, it, so I have no idea. Like One thing that I, I say commonly is that I don't necessarily believe that the value of Bitcoin will continue going up, but I am 100% convinced that the value of fiat will continue going down. So make of that what you will. Got it. One Bitcoin equals one Bitcoin. Got it. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Jameson, for joining me. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. Thanks for having me.